What does this airplane have in common with this airplane and this airplane? We're going to tell you in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. These three airplanes, the Vought F-7 Cutlass, Republic's XF-84H, and the Douglas X-3 Stiletto, were all considered failures in their day. And the reason was the power plants that propelled each of these aircraft. If you go to a Barnes and Noble or your favorite bookseller, you go to the bargain table, invariably there's gonna be a book entitled The World's Worst Aircraft or Aviation's Biggest Flops or even the 20 worst airplanes ever built. This is kind of a pet peeve of mine uh, because I don't agree. And the reason is that these were attempts at achieving aviation progress. Uh, they didn't work, but the point was to build them and see how things went in the flight test program. So I always joke that if I ever wrote a book like this, it would be called, wow, what in the heck were they thinking? What they were thinking was advanced design and progress. Jack Northrup envisioned the flying wing, the giant uh, X and YB-35 bombers that you see here, uh, converted to the YB-49 jet. It was an airplane that was ahead of its time. We're gonna tell you why it was not a successful machine. Republic had the uh, XF-84H, uh, not so affectionately nicknamed the Thunder Screech by anyone who was within five miles of it when it was running. Uh, the airplane was a failure, but it was an attempt to harness a turboprop uh, engine and a supersonic propeller to a jet airframe. Uh, it made all of 11 test flights, each of which uh, ended in an emergency landing on the lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base. Lockheed had this attempt at vertical flight, the uh, XFV-1 Salmon, uh, along with the Convair Pogo, uh, twin uh, contra-rotating propellers harnessed to an Allison uh, T-40 turboprop, uh, trying to make a takeoff and landing aircraft um, neither of which uh, worked well and went into service. Uh, that role was uh, later given to these airplanes and aircraft like them, the tilt rotor uh, XV-3 converter plane from Bell or the uh, Vought LTV uh, XC-142 uh, tilt wing aircraft. And again, these were attempts to achieve a vertical flight uh, neither of which were ultimately successful and none of which went into production. So that brings us to this series of aircraft. And yes, I've used this photo a, a whole bunch of times in my presentations, but as the great Ron Davies once told me, if you have a photo that's been used a lot, but it's the only one that really tells the story, use it as many times as you want. So in tribute to, the, uh, to Ron's memory, I'll just mention that the X-Plane family that you see here uh, was the pioneering group of aircraft in uh, the late 1940s and early 1950s. You have rocket and jet powered aircraft, a straight wing, swept wing, delta wing, uh, variable geometry wing, uh, all in the uh, name of flight test research. But the poster child, the one that uh, probably was photographed the most of any of them is uh, center in the photo and that's the Douglas X3 Stiletto. Even in the ads, the X-3 was rocketing into the stratosphere and uh, this was supposed to be a Mach 2 research jet. And I'm gonna uh, focus on this airplane uh, in the uh, telling the story of, uh, you know, considered failures, were they really not in my book? And I'll tell you why. The whole thing in the early 1950s was the quest to Mach 2, flying twice the speed of sound. Mach 1 was reached in 1947 and in 1953, on November 20th, the Douglas Skyrocket, seen here, flown by NACA test pilot Scott Crossfield, reached a speed of Mach 2.005. The first jet-powered airplane to fly Mach 2 was the North American X-10, uh, predecessor to the Navajo missile. And the first manned jet-powered Mach 2 aircraft was Lockheed's beautiful F-104 Starfighter. But in the early 50s, airplanes that could achieve that speed were relegated to rocket-powered research aircraft, and they had to be carried aloft in a mothership. So the idea of the X-3 was to have a Mach 2 airplane that could take off and land under its own power. Uh, to do that, the airplanes were uh, brought out on the lake bed, and uh, engines were started, and it made a three-mile takeoff run, if you can believe that, 
uh, it lifted off at 245 miles an hour, which uh, ironically is the same uh, uh, V2 speed as the French uh, British Concorde supersonic airliner. Uh, the difference is that the Concorde was off the ground at about 8,500 feet. The X-3, and I should mention there was only one built, uh, the aircraft made 54 flights. Uh, it survived and is uh, currently on display in the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, but again, it was considered a failure uh, because it didn't live up to its design potential. Instead of Mach 2, the fastest it ever flew was Mach 1.1 in a dive. So what happened? Why was that? The answer, as I mentioned, was in the power plant. The original design, two Westinghouse J46 turbojets producing 6,600 pounds of thrust each in afterburner. And due to uh, serious development problems with the J46, the uh, engine ultimately was never even built, but uh, the continual delays led Douglas engineers to uh, develop a plan to use an interim engine just to get the airplane through phase one flight test. And that was the Westinghouse J-34, which produced all of 4,850 pounds of thrust. Now, using interim engines is not anything new. It's been done on a number of airplanes. And let me show you the Allison J-35 and uh, upgraded to the Westinghouse J-40 were the first engines to power the Douglas Skyray, the XF-4D1 that you see here. The production airplane was powered by the Pratt & Whitney J-57, which allowed the uh, Douglas Skyray to become the Douglas Aircraft Company's first supersonic jet-powered airplane. The J-57 was used as the interim engine on the prototype F-105 Thunder Chief seen here. The production F-105 used the Pratt & Whitney J-75 power plant. The J-75 was used as the interim engine for the Lockheed A-12, which was the prototype for the famed SR-71 Blackbird, which used the Pratt & Whitney J-58, a 20,500 pound thrust turbo ramjet power plant. And of course, the X-15 was first flown with interim engines. Uh, two banks of XLR-11 rocket engines, four barrels each. This is the same engine that powered Chuck Yeager's Bell X-1. And this allowed the X-15 to take flight on September 17th, 1959. But the uh, ultimate powered aircraft flights were made uh, with the 50,000 pound thrust XLR-99, which propelled the X-15A2 to an ultimate speed of Mach 6.7, 4,250 miles per hour. Let's talk about the people involved in the X-3. Uh, the X-3 made its first flight on October 20th, 1952, piloted by Douglas test pilot, Bill Bridgman. Here we see Bridgman uh, surrounded by the uh, dedicated Douglas team up at Edwards Air Force Base that uh, supported all the flights up there. And Bridgman wore the T-1 partial pressure suit, which uh, was quite futuristic in its day. But speaking of futuristic, even though this airplane uh, looks uh, archaic by today's standards, this was the world's largest airplane in 1941. It's the Douglas XB-19. And I'm showing this to you because it's uh, pictured here in final assembly in Hangar 1 at Santa Monica. 10 years later, that same building uh, is seen in the background with this airplane, the X-3 prototype probably the most significant 10 years in aviation history in terms of ultimate progress. The X-3 uh, is uh, equipped with a downward firing ejection seat for two reasons. Number one, it didn't have a canopy. It was an enclosed cockpit. And number two, at high speed, uh, the downward seat would ensure that the pilot cleared the airplane and didn't uh, have a tail strike uh, if, if it, it was uh, an upward firing seat. Thankfully, it never had to be used, especially at low altitude. But there's more to the story. That enclosed cockpit with the trademark dark tinted windows uh, was the first cockpit of any airplane to be air conditioned. And here we see the X-3 on its special transporter. Uh, this is the beginning of its trip to Edwards. You can see the uh, wood framework for what became the cover for the, at that time, secret design. But this truck uh, was used to bring the X-3 from its hangar to uh, the lake bed. And then once out on the lake bed, they would start the engines. Uh, 
And uh, here you can see the uh, cockpit entry, that uh, large hatch after the nose wheel uh, is the seat in the lowered position for the pilot to ride up into the cockpit. Here's a nice close up of the tail. And this uh, shows the iconic uh, testing division logo uh, the Douglas flight test logo was the uh, mother duck uh, ready to kick the two ducklings out of the nest uh, orbiting the earth. And uh, that was on every uh, prototype Douglas airplane ever flown. Uh, also, I should mention the colored strips that you see there uh, on the horizontal and on the lower uh, fuselage tail cone uh, are lacquer paint that was heat sensitive. Uh, the different colors would melt at different temperatures and that gave engineers a good visual clue as to the heating property of the aft fuselage. So what happened with these exotic odd looking aircraft that uh, didn't work when they were first flown in the late 40s and 1950s? The answer uh, lies in this automotive example. Uh, this is the uh, instrument panel of the iconic 1963 split window Corvette and compare this to today's Tesla. And that's the answer to the question, how did everything uh, wind up working today? It's digital technology. This uh, wasn't available in the 1950s, but you have digital design and digital flight control systems. And that was the game changer. So the Bell Converta plane, the XB-3, evolved into the Bell Boeing V-22 Osprey. The Northrop Flying Wings evolved into the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit stealth bomber. And I always like to point out that the original uh, XB and YB-35, B-49, uh, and the B-2 all share the identical wingspan, 172.0 feet. That Lockheed design for a vertical takeoff and landing airplane evolved into the F-35, uh, used by the Marines in the VTOL or Stovall short takeoff and vertical landing role as seen here. And by the way, that uh, two, Mach 2.005 top speed of the Douglas Skyrocket was exceeded two decades later by an airliner that carried 100 passengers. So it was possible to uh, uh, be dining on your uh, five-star Beef Wellington uh, at Mach 2.03, faster than the Skyrocket flew. So was the X3 ultimately a failure? Well, in the sense that it didn't uh, achieve its design goals, yes, it failed to achieve its ultimate design performance. But in my book, it's a testimony to America's aerospace industry in the 1950s with the dedicated folks that you see here in this photo, picture the X3 at Santa Monica. And this was the core of America's uh, greatness in the 1950s in aviation. Uh, there were many other countries that uh, offered pioneering efforts, uh, Great Britain, France, Russia, all contributed. But uh, I wanted to use the example of the Douglas X-3 Stiletto as an airplane considered a failure, but really a, a, a valiant attempt at aviation progress. And here we see the X-3 in the weight and balance uh, facility, a kind of primitive way of doing it, lowering it with a crane. But that's the way it was done back in that era. And uh, the point being that not all airplanes considered a failure were failures. And there you have it, the story of America's aerospace industry at a pioneering age. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. And thanks also to the great folks that uh, make these presentations possible with their uh, photos and great information. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, take care.